Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real, live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew 30 million on the place. Yes, 30 million dollars. And then it was abandoned. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate. And there was even blame cast on the workers, saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of their story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. But why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isles in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character Mowgli, then you might better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you'd know it was the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened slash pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney brought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold their properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was the concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace, surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear. Well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and loincloths not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also a somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play, and their opinions turned on a dime. But back to Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic, and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irate tourists. 
then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down, and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give the place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isles, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit he found there. Stuff just left behind. Things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there just felt as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's Palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace. Take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there, because honestly it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article just to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the palace resort, or rather I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of the place. That had been scrubbed clean. Even more odd, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about the place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, though that was to be expected since they had all swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lauding their embarrassment. Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old as hell map I received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I only remembered it months into my research and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years. Or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, Where would I find Mowgli's? The drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area, mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there, and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous, monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from a giant sequoia. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers, and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap, with hand-painted letters scrawled in black. Abandoned by Disney. 
Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not drive. So, grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as ragged as the entryway. Palm trees stood, unattended and ragged, among the piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking, bug-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos, as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and smelling blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped up by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, a friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave towards no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swaths of his fur and vines ensnared his platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint hadn't peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping maw where they had been, Someone had once again painted, abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the cool stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums. But no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal counters, desks, giant fake trees. They were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step. I checked the floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was, as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space. No expenses spared. Every glass surface was broken. Every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat. And as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it almost was impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging and carefully let go. But within seconds, it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place, just like the Treasure Island Resort. Someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about half an inch of rancid, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and the sinks and the bidets in the ladies' room, yes, I went there, all dripped, leaked, or just ran freely. I thought they would have shut off the water long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or radio in one room, as I could have sworn I heard a quiet conversation coming out. 
though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind. This is what it sounded like. The first person said, I didn't believe it, the second I couldn't understand. The first voice, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. The second voice, your father told you, and the first one was unintelligible. I know, it sounds ridiculous, I'm just telling you what I experienced. Why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or were some vagrants who had holed up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and had wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 foot long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, as the light fell onto the object in the perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the detail of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked directly into my eyes, turned, and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass and into the trees. All 80 feet of it, its head long disappeared into the woods before its tail even left a sunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I'd read about the sharks at Treasure Isle, and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded. Utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been. Back towards the palace. Even though that snake was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances. Backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slaps to my own face to get myself right in the head again after that. I looked for a place to sit down, as my legs were feeling a bit jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down, unless I wanted to recline in broken glass and dead leaf carpet, or haul myself up into a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace's lobby and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for a startling accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the Abandoned by Disney motto I had become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh floor with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign, read, Mascots only, thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit, for two reasons. One. A mascots only area would definitely have some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals. Not the looters. Nobody. This was the only place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wantonly steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, 
Actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me, and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall, something nobody else had apparently thought of, or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascot's only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I had seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens, there were clocks, even a punching clock on the wall complete with filled out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even a small break room with an old, static-filled television, and long, rotted-out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalypse movies where everything is left in a state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascot's only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, papers scattered and almost melded with the damp floor, and a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy, anything wood disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dank, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached the black and yellow stripped floor with the words, Character Prep 1, stenciled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where the costumes were kept and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, however, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound, and the door creaked open, slowly. Inside, the room was completely dark pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to just keep getting brighter, until all the bulbs exploded, but just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers towards the back. What I found odd though, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was laying on its back in the center of the floor, like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotted and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even more strange, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls, up and down angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen, putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, 
just one of the bedraggled character heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud, clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet, and there, between my shoes, was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot's head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, for any number of reasons that may seem silly, but I had to take a picture. I needed proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind, right from the start, that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, that photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First, sitting up, then climbing to its feet. The Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room its fake face just staring directly at me, and all I could do was mumble to myself, no, 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 no. With shaking hands, a violently thrashing heart, and legs that had once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the opposite creature now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey Mouse costume. As the camera moved my unsteady hands, the dead pixels floated around the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. And the camera died, went blank and quiet and broken. I raise my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. <laughs> its voice was quiet, but there was an impossible form of distortion to it. Wanna see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaw. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood, so much thick, pasty yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh. I only cared about getting away. Above the doorway out of this room, I saw the final message scrawled onto the metal with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran home from that place, fled from my sanity, if not my very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone knowing about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out.
It's been a while since I've written anything related to the Disney Corporation, and I'm sure you can understand why. A lot has been going on since my last post. I've received a lot of questions and concerns from folks who read my first-hand account of Mowgli's Palace, a resort that was built and abandoned by Disney. I want to thank everyone who mirrored my post. It's been taken down from a few places, mostly corporate sites that were easily leaned on by a larger power. However, for every nuke topic or disappearing blog post, it seemed like a hundred more have popped up. This is something they'll have to face. There's no turning back for them. None for me either. I'm definitely being followed. For the first two months or so, I chalked it up to paranoia. Any casual glance or half-smile in my direction set me off. Hair standing on the back of my neck and everything. The first one, or rather the first one I was actually able to spot, was a telephone worker milling around my apartment complex. He was middle-aged, doughy, dressed up as you'd expect. But something seemed off about him. I couldn't place it, but I knew this wasn't just my imagination acting up. He was awkward and out of place. Not somebody who was comfortable doing his routine job. I followed him around the corner, only to lose him there. When I turned to go back home, there he was, staring directly at me about ten feet behind me, expressionless and cold. Exploring? He asked. That was all he said. There was an accusing tone to his voice. Tell me, what blue-collar phone jockey does that? I guess that's the worst part. Never feeling safe, never feeling alone. That, and the occasional Disney merchandise left somewhere for me to find. Little rubber Mickeys in the mailbox. A Disney Adventures magazine on my bookshelf. They hide little Mickeys everywhere. Three circles, one big, two small, and the silhouette of the famous mouse's head. I've started keeping a running list of Mickeys I've found coffee cup rings on my coffee table, one big, two small, colored glass bottles left on the doorstep, viewed from top down, all the bottles red, graffiti on the wall on my way to work, a huge earth, small sun and moon in the proper locations, they're everywhere. People have emailed me about this as well. If you repost anything I have to say, you're going to start finding those outlines. I guarantee it. The best one by far. One that actually made me laugh because of the horror of it all. Was a drawing in chalk next to my car. I was taken aback at first. Walking through the parking garage, keeping an eye out for people following me. The outline seemed a perfect match for, well, a murder victim. You're probably familiar with if you've read my past post. Written in yellow, paint, I'm sure, was a single word, retract. The only good thing that has come out of all this is that I know I'm not the only one who's seen something they shouldn't have. I'm not going to give their names because, well, if I have to tell you why, you haven't been paying attention. Researcher goes to Disney parks whenever he can, all throughout the year. He's not going to have fun, enjoy the rides, etc. He's looking for the gas gods. There's been a long tradition, apparently of people reporting strange patrons throughout the park. Silent, motionless, staring patrons of every age, 
shape and size. Men and women, adults, children, and teens, all wearing Disney-themed gas masks. Way back when, Disney would get tons of complaints about oddly dressed folks following others around the park. Folks who would then merge into the crowds and disappear. Later on, the gas mask caused folks to draw other conclusions. Reports of possible terrorists and bombers started flowing. All of those reports likely went straight into the trash can. I know I can't find any sign of any such occasions reported on by the media. Although you should be aware of the fact that Disney can pretty much control its press like no other. Researcher goes to the parks, talks to a few people, and tries to not draw any attention to himself. He'll just ask three or four families if they've seen his friend who's wearing a funny mask. He has yet to see a gas got for himself, though on one occasion a child pointed him towards Frontier Town. As he raced through the crowd, he heard a single voice ahead cry out, Mommy, I want a goofy air mask too. A fellow I'll call Lifeguard worked in a Disney water park from 2001 through 2003. He stood at the top of a huge water slide and made sure none of the kids got too rowdy. He passed the kids through one at a time, telling them over and over again to be safe, keep their arms in, and so on. One day, as he tells it, this fat kid goes down the tube and doesn't come out the other end. He sent two or three kids after. The whole thing moves at a steady clip, so naturally you'd expect that if Fatty got stuck, the kids that followed him were stuck too. Not so. Only the big kid disappeared. Everyone else comes out the other end cheering and splashing like nothing's wrong. Lifeguard shuts down the slide, much the aggravation of the kids waiting. Before he can go through any of Disney's strict procedures, splash, Fatty finally comes out. Staff members pulled the kid out of the water. He sank like a stone when he hit, his skin already blue and his eyes wide. All he would say was, no face kids, and stop squeezing. The kid was okay, in case you're wondering. He got carted off right to the medical center. When lifeguard was told to open the slide back up, he made a big fuss about how it clearly wasn't safe. Despite his complaints, he was threatened with firing and begrudgingly opened the slide again. From that point on, he kept a closer eye on the kids. Every so often, they'd come out in the wrong order, never as stunned as the fat kid, but always with a vague look of concern, a dreamy half-stupor that seemed as if they were trying to figure out what was reality. They'd take on some water and choke a bit, and they'd never come back up to write again. I read his emails with the same sort of unease you might be feeling right now. I wanted him to share his own story, but in the end, he didn't want to expose himself that way. I can't say I blame him. Snow White, which wasn't the actual role she played, was a character in the park. She had a nice little tidbit for me. You know what happens when a costume employee drops dead in his suit? Like one second he's taking a picture with little Jimmy, and the next he's had a fatal stroke? A second costume mascot in the area has to sit with a corpse on a curb or bench and wait for a designated dry cleaner to arrive and cart the body away in a discreet manner. All the while, patrons have no idea they're sitting with the dead body for photo ops. Feel free to check your photo albums at this point. That was bad. But another fellow, Janitor, went completely off the creepy charts. Disney World, and probably others, is built with a series of underground tunnels just below your feet. Three stories worth. 
Anything and everything you can imagine is down there, for use of the employees. They're called Utilidors, Utility Corridors. Basically, that's the reason you don't see characters out of place or janitors wandering through the park. They pop in and out of hidden doors and travel a concealed town you're walking on. Janitor told me something that might be common knowledge, but was nonetheless news to me. Walt Disney had several apartments built into his parks. There's one above Cinderella's castle. There's one in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. They're all over the place. More than that, there are nightclubs, a movie theater, a bowling alley, and much more. All behind doors built right into the whimsical facades you pass by without a second look. Club 22 is one such hidden area. If you have the cash to join the exclusive club, you don't. Then you'll have access to it, and much more. Club 22 is a place where anything goes. Disney Co. calls these places dark zones, spots where the squeaky clean visage of Mickey Mouse gives way to drinking, drugs, and yes, sex. Conversely, the rest of the park is the bright zone, with a few gray zone utilidors between. As far as the janitor said, it wasn't always that way. It was more of a slow decline, and the gradual relaxation of social norms within that elite group. The reason he knows all of this, you may have already guessed. He cleaned it. After a lengthy background check in a non-disclosure form, Janitor moved up from a park attendant to one of the Dark Zone cleaning crew. Now, before you get some satanic human sacrifice vision in your head, Janitor saw nothing of the sort. Lots of empty alcohol bottles, yes. Used condoms scattered like deflated New Year's balloons, oh yeah. He cleaned up his fair share of blood, piss, and vomit. But it was all down to the unrestricted behavior of patrons as opposed to any sort of cult behavior. At least that's how he sees it in retrospect. All that trash, that profane shit, went into a furnace and mingled with the smoke of a quaint cottage's chimney. If you've been to Disney World, you've breathed ultra-condensed sin. Breaking up this information was Hammer. Hammer mailed me the old-fashioned way, though I don't know how he got my home address. He sent me photocopies of work papers proving his employment, with the instructions to burn them when I was convinced, which I did, gladly. Hammer worked around the Disney World Park, doing demolition and construction. At one point, he approached a superior regarding some strange construction plans. There was a wide, rectangular area marked off on the blueprints, about the size of a supermarket. The area was left unnamed, and only bore the words, Do not dig. Not only was his superior in the dark, but he was super fucking purposely in the dark. He didn't want to talk about it, he didn't want to know about it, and ended the conversation with, This space intentionally left blank. Hammer didn't get it. The area seemed a waste of space and it was directly conflicting with the work his team had been given. He started poking around the area on his off time, finding only a derelict steel door and a great span of concrete just beyond. It was a supermarket's worth of blank, gray floor. Soon after, Hammer started picking gas gods out of the crowd. Unlike all other reports, the people the things would stand in full view of the guy. They'd cluster together in the distance, or they'd just be pressed against a wall when he turned a corner. He said they moved weird, like they were weak or injured, like a deer that's been run down by a hunter and can't flee anymore. 
the gas masks the Disney character faces with filters jammed in. He noted that they seemed wet on the inside, like condensation on a car window. Tiny beads of water glimmered behind the glass, making it impossible for any of them to actually see. Probing further, Hammer started asking questions of anyone and everyone who had been working in the park for a decade or more. He hit dead ends throughout, until he was directed to Ida, an elderly woman who worked in a restaurant on Main Street. She had been there since way back, and though nobody had the balls to ask directly, everyone knew she had plenty of terrible stories to tell. Hammer asked about the empty space, then about the gas mask customers, and at first he thought he would have received the same non-answer he had gotten so far. She was quiet, eerily quiet. Room Zero, she croaked, a single shaking hand placed to her cheek, as if she were a little girl fearing a father's punishment. She didn't meet the man's gaze for the entire conversation. Room Zero, as it turned out, was yet another hidden room, just like the apartments in Club 22. However, its sheer size and its spot deep beneath the park set it apart from any of the fun dark zones. It was a bomb shelter. Room Zero was built to withstand a massive attack, be it conducted by foreign or domestic enemies. Room Zero was to be stocked with enough rations to feed the entire park's average number of patrons at any given moment, and housed a similar yet lavish panic room of sorts for Disney higher-ups. During World War II, Official Disney gas masks were actually produced for children to wear in the event of an attack. The idea was that it would be less scary for kids if Mickey's face was emblazoned on the wartime safety device. Yes, I know the obvious problems with that. During the Cold War scare of the 60s, when Disney World was constructed, Room Zero was stocked with similar masks as well. Whether they cared about the fears of children, or just callous branding, the things found their way down there. What's more, some genius decided that kids would then be frightened by the gas masks their parents wore. And so all masks, adult and child, were made to comply to this insane standard. Ida described it as treating a wound with lemon juice. None of this explained what Hammer had been seeing, though. Not only the seemingly supernatural appearances, but the emptied out room as well. I've been in there, he explained. There's nothing but a cement floor and four walls. No. Ida shook her head and covered her mouth, stifling a sob. You've been on top of it. Someone, or something, sounded the alarm one day when the park was at full capacity. The warning was clear. It was supposedly an air attack. Security ushered everyone down into the tremendous shelter. There, they were ordered to put on their masks and hunker down for the duration of the assault. Everything was quiet for about 30 minutes save for the crying children and the frightened whispers. No one wanted to die, and so they were thankful in a way for this strange measure of safety. Then, the first scream rang out. Waves of shrieks and yelps rippled through the crowd, from one wall to the other, back and forth. Commotion from the disgruntled patrons was drowning it out. Despite security guards urging to calm down and keep their cool, the crowd became more and more agitated until finally, 
after nearly an hour of madness. Lights flickered, then died. What followed could be described only as utter chaos. In the dark, only the wails of the young and the anguished cries of adults could be heard in a massive, swelling din that bloodied the ears of all within that black echo chamber. A group of staff members and a select few patrons made it out of the door, ready to face the war above, rather than the insanity below. What they found, of course, was a desolate, yet untouched theme park. The music continued to play, echoing through silent storybook towns. Upon returning to room zero, the few who stood at the top of the steel staircase that led down into the pitch blackness heard no signs of the previous fray. There was only silence. Ida herself descended that staircase, despite the begging of those she left above. She reached the reinforced doors, herself now awash in darkness and hearing only the buzzing in her ears. A single voice came out of that dark chamber. Shut the door, dear. You're letting out all the coal. Gripped by terror, she did just that. Within days, the entire thing, shelter, staircase, all of it, was covered with feet upon feet of cement. Air systems and generators above its ceiling were removed, creating the large, empty space. They're all still down there, Ida told Hammer down there with whoever that was. You might notice I've used Ida's name. Unfortunately, she passed away soon after telling her story. Accidental fall, supposedly, after getting out of bed to turn on a light. Such a company devotee, the paper reported, that her entire bedroom was covered with Mickey silhouettes. Suggestion. We could use another person at check-in during peak hours. Suggestion. Please move the hot dog cart away from the main water slide. Also, please have the water slide staff keep an eye out for children who just ate. When anyone gets sick in there, three or four people have to go through it before we even know about it. Suggestion. It would be nice if we had a way to give more detailed information anonymously. Maybe private meeting time with management? Suggestion. Need more security at South Gate. Suggestion. Music in the reptile house keeps slowing down or reversing. It's very annoying. Suggestion. Please tell the mascots not to try eating in their costumes. We keep getting one with food all over its face, and we think someone is trying to be funny. The mouth opening is mesh, so eating isn't even possible. Suggestion. Please, fix the music in the reptile house. It's still driving me up the wall. Suggestion. Guests are complaining about the amount of towels in their rooms. Suggestion. Need a better or newer coffee machine for the break room. Suggestion. I wasn't going to say anything because I'm pretty tolerant. But please, stop admitting children without faces. They won't stay in the guest areas. Suggestion. The common area could use a bigger selection of DVDs and games. The collection is already getting stale. Suggestion. Still need security at the South Gate. What's cheaper, having a staffer pass by once in a while or painting over all the vandalism? Suggestion. South Gate needs more security. 
Suggestion. What are we doing about the profanities at the employee exit? Send security there more times of the day or whatever. Suggestion. I don't feel safe leaving the south gate at the end of my shift. Suggestion. Frank is cheating at solitaire when he thinks I'm not watching. Please do something about this immediately. Suggestion. Tell the mascots to stay out of where they don't belong. One of them keeps turning off the music in the reptile house. I can't tell who because of the suit. Have a meeting or something. Suggestion. Please give the mascots more break time or allow them to take short breathers during work hours. Sweat and body odor are one thing, but now we keep getting the same suit full of vomit. Suggestion. Stop Frank. He's a menace. It has now spread to Sudoku. I am not making this up. Suggestion. Sorry to write on a napkin, but we need more suggestion cards. Or else somebody is stealing them all. Suggestion. Stop the fucking music. Suggestion. I swear, all these blank kids are getting into everything. Every time I kill one of them, the others just misbehave more. I keep finding them in piles at the bottom of stairways, and they think it's funny. It's not funny. I can't get through. Suggestion. We need more suggestion cards. Suggestion. We received a mascot suit with paint on his gloves. Someone took it to the south gate, and the color matches what the vandal is using. Might be worth looking into. Also, where are the cards? Suggestion. Costume sticking to the sores. Suggestion. It's too hard to write with this gloves on. Suggestion. Thanks for the suggestion cards, finally. What are we doing about the staffing check-in at peak hours? Suggestion. Once more, sorry for the napkin, we're out of cards again. Suggestion. One of the mascots cornered me in the supply closet and grabbed my breasts. I've told Michael Sheehan about it, but I don't think he's going to do anything because I don't know who was in the outfit. I'm going to file a lawsuit if management continues to avoid my calls. This is a final notice. Additionally, please restock the cards. I suspect they were removed so you could discourage my reports. Suggestion. I'm a mouse. Suggestion. Fuck. You. Suggestion. Someone's taking out light bulbs. I mean, just everywhere. The guests are getting increasingly angry about flipping switches, only to have nothing happen. Suggestion. When are we getting some new DVDs in the common room? I'm not complaining because they're old movies, just that plenty are scratched and don't play all the way through. Suggestion. What's the ETA on that coffee maker? Suggestion. The vending machines on the third floor in the guest area are constantly unplugged, and the money slots are often jammed with suggestion cards. I don't even know what these cards are talking about. Suggestion. We need more cards. Again. Suggestion. Try to find Frank. Suggestion. I will give you clues about Frank, okay? Suggestion. Clue number one. It's cold. Suggestion. Clue number two. It's wet. Suggestion. We need another coat of paint on the south gate. Are you doing anything about this clown? Suggestion. Clue number three. Flush. Suggestion. The hot dog cart is still next to the water slide, and there have been two more incidents involving children getting sick halfway through the pipe. This is really reflecting poorly on the resort. Suggestion. I don't think you're looking for Frank. Suggestion. Hey, I don't want to be a pain, but seriously, where are the cards? This box is pointless. Suggestion. I keep sinking into the floor, or... Suggestion. Maybe it's just that I feel like it. Suggestion. I can't get any rest, because there's too much to do. Every time I lie down, guests keep asking if I'm okay. Suggestion. 
I can't get my head off. 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 I Suggestion. Ignore last card. It was my real head. I forgot. Suggestion. The costume is sticking to my source. And there are more sores. Suggestion. All I am is sores. Suggestion. The costume is breathing. And if I don't match its movements, I can't get any air. Suggestion. I keep locking the gates, but someone keeps opening them again. Please tell them to stop doing that because it lets everyone out again, and I feel that's counterproductive. Suggestion. They found Frank, and they're going to blame me. Please advise. Suggestion. You're gonna love this. Frank's face was like a bad looking plate of mashed potatoes when they pulled him out. But when I laughed at it, everyone looked at me. Even the people with faces, which is odd. Suggestion. I have to think of what to do. Suggestion. Oh. Suggestion. I know. Hang on. Suggestion. I'm not sure if the suggestion box is the right place for this, but security isn't doing much about my complaint. Over the last couple days, I've been circling the resort and counting the number of staffers. As far as I can tell, there are more mascots on the grounds than we have on payroll. Security says it doesn't make sense, but I think we have one extra. Suggestion. Please help. Costumes are heavy with people inside. And there's no hook left for me. If you really believe in something, it can be yours. That's how we've been conditioned to think. Corrupt us. That was the subject of an email I received before my ISP dropped me. My phone turned into a brick the same day. Hell, I think it was the same precise moment. Though it's difficult to know for sure since I only tried it after my laptop couldn't connect. Corruptus. I'd never heard of the word before. And to be honest, I'm not exactly sure it is a word at all. It could be Latin. It sounds like Latin. I haven't been able to look it up, and this is the first time I'm getting on the web since my unexpected removal from the grid. I tried to sign on at the local library, by the way. My card was revoked. Unpaid late fees for books I've never read, much less checked out. Mostly borderline fetish material and self-help books for various mental illnesses. The apparently quite detailed tome of weapons of mass destruction seemed to be of the most concern for the librarian. I hung around the library for maybe half an hour until someone left a computer logged in and unguarded. When I went to check my email uh, to tweet a complaint about what had happened, those accounts were gone as well. Honestly, I was a pretty huge dumbass for expecting them to be there. It wasn't long before I noticed the computer's rightful user pointing me out at the front desk. I guess she wasn't a fan of the direct approach. I was out the door before anyone could cause a real fuss. It's been two years since I left Mowgli's palace and never looked back. The original blog post has come and gone so much across so many different sites that I can barely even remember the first place I tried to host it. If I'd known how far this would go, I don't know if I would have been able to hack out that clumsy, flawed account of what happened. 
the pressure would have been too great. I suppose there's a certain level of comfort in the idea no one will ever actually see or care about your work. It seems like a lot of sites remove the information, either upon direct request from Disney, or on their own in fear of reprisal. I tried to keep up my After Abandoned blog for a while. I don't know how many people out there saw my notes on Room Zero, Club 22, and so on. They're still around if you look. At least at the time of writing this. Yes, Club 22 exists. No, it's not a typo of Club 33. I later learned from the same contact that there's an 11 as well. And supposedly the debauchery only grows as the numbers get lower. I heard of a club double zero, but I can't confirm that as clearly as I can with the previous contact. I also don't know if it has any connection to the room of a similar name. Yes, the door probably said characters or cast members instead of mascots. I know, I know, I hear you all. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure your memory is crystal clear in moments of abject terror, right? Overall, I'm glad that my words have spread so far and wide. But the downside is that so few of you are taking this seriously. I can't stress this enough. Treasure Island, real. The Utilidors, real. Just because you can't substantiate the rest doesn't mean it's a cool story. Instead of picking apart the inaccuracies and making games about how cool it would be to have been in my position, maybe people can start taking this seriously and digging into what's going on. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want this to be a rant. I want to stay focused and make sure I post exactly what I want to make public. All of the stress, the stalkers, the phone calls, the broken windows. I know that's all supposed to keep me off track. They want me confused, scared. And most of all, they want me quiet. There's a team of men and women in suits that I've seen at random times, here and there. I call them the focus group, because they pop up with clipboards and pens taking notes about everything I do. They all have the same outfits, the same thick-rimmed nerd glasses, the same red pens that just scream, we're judging you. The first time I noticed them, they were following me through the mall. I looped and turned, trying to be sure they were following me. And there they were, every step of the way. Days later, I spotted them again in the laundromat window, across from my new apartment. I chased one down, once, the tubbiest one. They stayed silent through the entire chase, and even the scuffle that ensued, when I wrenched the clipboard from his hand. I only found page after page of off-kilter, random gibberish, coupled with crude Mickey silhouettes all in the same red ink. I know it sounds insane to say that a group of men and women in black are following me and taking nonsense notes, but I think that's the point. I think the idea is that it should drive me insane, and if it doesn't, you'll still think I'm crazy just for saying it. It's a no-win situation. I will forever regret that trip to Emerald Isle. But on the other hand, I'll always be grateful to the people who have come forward, anonymously to share their experiences with me. Whoever mailed me the suggestion box from the resort is basically my hero at this point. To read what I'd written about the place and still brave the journey. Wow. I can't imagine how that felt. Whoever you may be. 
You even left the original corroded lock in the box so I'd know it was legit. To do all of that without even taking a look inside for yourself must have been really, really hard. Thank you. If you haven't noticed, I'm treating this post a lot like my final installment. There is a reason for that. I don't know how long I can keep subverting Disney's attempts at silencing me before some sort of final action is taken. I have no doubt that somewhere at this very moment, someone is using my identity to commit a crime that would discredit me. That or men in white jackets are about to show me a lovely little padded cell. I don't know what's going to come of this. That's the worst part, I suppose. All I know is that it's coming. So what is Corruptus? Well, as I mentioned, it was the title of an email I received. One that was presumably deleted along with my account. It was blank and seemed to exist for the sole purpose of placing an attached text document in my hands. Too bad for the powers that be. I had already printed it the moment I saw it. Not much they can do to reverse that, can they? I should have mentioned. Remember that library? I used their copier to run off a few thousand duplicates of that letter. A few hundred are stapled in random places, a few hundred were passed out to random people, and the rest. Let's leave those as a little surprise. Have fun trying to stifle that, you mouse fuckers. Without any more rambling, here's the letter, word for word. It arrived from a source whose email address I won't disclose though I assume it's an untraceable dummy account anyway. Known Corruptus Incidents up to and including January 2015 Treasure Island Extreme agitation slash inappropriate activity within vulture population Mild to moderate agitation slash inappropriate human activity Resolved Corruptus, Unidentified Avian Species, Abandoned, Final. Disney's Pop Century Resort, Misplaced Immobile Objects, Chronological Displacement Slash Anachronism, Unresolved Corruptus, Wandering Entity, Pending. Disney's River County, Microorganism Infestation, Unresolved Corruptus, Clear Man, aka See Through Man, aka Friendly John, Abandoned, Final. Image Works, The What If Labs, Second Floor. Multiple Missing Persons Reports Regarding Dreamfinder School of Drama, Pin Screen Fatality, Vibrating Mirror Sickness, Unresolved Corruptus, Willy Wizard, Installation. Abandoned. Final. Mowgli's Palace. Auditory hallucination and or projection. Misplaced and mobile objects. Moderate to severe agitation slash inappropriate human activity. Unresolved corruptus. Inverted character. Abandoned. Final. The New Global Neighborhood. Resolved corruptus. Fiber Optic Worm, NGNC1, Resolved Corruptus, Digital Howl, NGNC2, Resolved, Repurposed. Room Zero, Sudden Onset Mass Hysteria, Auditory Hallucination and or Projection, Unresolved Corruptus, Unknown, Contained. Final.
It took a few readings before I could get my head around this. Essentially, if the attached file was to be believed, then the events I had experienced were not part of an isolated incident. The events within Room Zero, the gas cuts, they seem like part of a much larger problem. What is Corruptus? Corruption. I don't really need Google Translate for that. Corruption of what, though? Dreams? Ideas? Desires? I've never been a religious man, but I was dragged to Sunday school more than enough times to know about golden calves, false gods created by man, icons, graven images, Characters. Mascots. If you believe in the Bible at all, and I'm not sure I do, especially not after what I've seen, then maybe God wasn't angry because people worshipped other things. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe. If enough people believe in something hard enough, there's a chance it will come to be. Since we're naturally flawed beings, that means there's a very good chance such a thing would become corrupted. If you think about it, Disney's animated films have always had one overriding message. Clap your hands and believe hard enough and Tinkerbell will live. When you wish upon a star, anything your heart desires. People like to say Disney has some connection to Satanism, but I never bought into that. I still don't. I think they've been trying to create that golden calf, a god idol that everyone believes in. One that everyone loves. It's almost as if any dream or idea that is shared by enough human hearts and minds has a real chance of being born into the world. The creatures, if any exist beyond what I saw with my own eyes, I think they're the deformed half-starts. Random manifestations of some dark, unquantifiable, non-life that seeped into our state of being. They're mistakes of reality. Cosmic abortions. The corrupted. Did everyone in Emerald Isle harbor such a negative impression of Mowgli's palace? How potent was the fear of nuclear war on the day Room Zero became full? If you want to find gas gods and mystery voices, does that search bring about the very thing you're looking for? How many children have been disappointed, confused, or scarred for life when they saw Mickey without his head? These are questions I'm never going to be able to answer. I don't know if anyone can. Speaking personally, this will probably be the last time I talk to you about Disney and everything I've learned about them. I'm truly sorry for that. Especially since there's so much more I could say. Unconfirmed rumors, documents and items I've received that now seem to be gone forever. I thought they were just trying to contain that Mickey costume. I thought that's why they went out of their way, to keep the public in the dark about so much. Why they coerced and bullied to get their way. Now I realize, I was wrong. It was this. It was always this. All along. 
They didn't want anything like this getting out. I wish you all good luck. And I know I need the same from you. Thank you.